Tupelo, Mississippi provides us with a remarkable case study in community and economic development. Dr. Vaughn Grisham is the director of the McLean Institute at the University of Mississippi. He has studied Tupelo for more than 30 years and has shared the lessons of Tupelo with communities across the nation and around the world. The story, as Grisham tells it, explains how leadership and carefully planned community development efforts transformed an area that was among the poorest in the nation. He begins with data from the 1940 census. In 1940, Lee County, Mississippi, was arguably the poorest county in, the, in Mississippi. And I told people that if you're the poorest county in Mississippi, God help you, because you are desperately poor. In fact, average family income was less than $2 a day in 1940. To make matters worse, a tornado had roared through the middle of town in 1936, decimating the business district. The following year, there was a bitter strike at the textile mill, the only manufacturing plant in town. What do you suppose they wanted in terms of wages? 1937. They wanted 15 cents an hour and they wanted their workload limited to 40 hours. At that point in time, they were making one dollar a day. They made 10 cents an hour working 10 hours a day. What the workers did was to have a sit-down start. They simply stayed in the factory when it was closed. They would not leave and said they would not leave until they got 15 cents an hour and a 40 hour work. Now the tension group, the National Guard was called out and howitzers were aimed at American citizens. They fired them. And I talked to the general in charge of them when they fired them. And he said when we fired them, those people came out of that factory like wasps. And they had wrenches and they had sticks and they said, my God, we're going to kill you, some bitches. <laughs> Are you going to kill us? <laughs> or we're not going to stand in there and, be, and, and let you shoot us. Now, that leaves a lasting scar in a community. That, that has a long time stay in the back. <coughs> now, in this struggle, my mentor, George McLean, sided with the laborers. And he wrote front page editorials. And he attacked the, the wealthy who owned that factory in front page editorials. They hated his guts. And he wouldn't back down. 27 years old, and he was standing up to these very powerful people. Between grinding poverty, natural disaster, and civil strife, it would not be surprising if the story of Tupelo ended right here. But it does not. In fact, Tupelo today is one of the most successful and prosperous cities in the nation. Grisham tells about some of their accomplishments in creating jobs and growing their economy. They have added more than they have more than 1,000 new industrial jobs for 19 consecutive years. We're right now making an inventory of how many jobs we have. We're not really sure. I'm going to give you the conservative estimate. The conservative estimate is this community, which in 1940 had 8,000 people. The conservative estimate today is that there are 52,000 jobs in two and you do the math. You got more jobs than you got people. The economy in Lee County has outgrown the national economy for 30 years. The last 30 years have been the most prosperous years in U.S. history. And in Mississippi, in Mississippi, in the backwaters of Mississippi, the poorest county in the United States, perhaps, has outgrown the national economy. 
U.S. Department of Agriculture in the 1950s cited Tupelo and Lee County as the model for rural development in the United States. The National Chamber of Commerce cited Tupelo as the model for community development in the United States. The Federal Reserve System of Atlanta cited Tupelo and Lee County as the model for community development. The National Civic League, located in Colorado, identifies the 10 most outstanding communities in the United States every year and gives them what they call All-American City Awards. Tupelo was the first southern city to win this. They were the first city in the United States to win it twice. They are the only city in the United States to win it three times. They won it last in 2000 and 2001, and they will win a fourth. They're that good. Now, our purpose really is not so much to brag about Tupelo, but to learn from it. How'd you do that? How'd you get started and how'd you do it? Grisham goes on to explain the process that unfolded in Tupelo. He points out that what happened in Tupelo was not a result of natural advantages. In fact, Tupelo lacked the advantages many communities have. There were no major highways, they were not close to an urban center, and they had no particular natural resources or scenic attraction. All they had was people, and even the value of that resource was limited by low literacy rates, poverty, and deep divisions. Grisham's Tupelo model illustrates how the process of community economic development requires a solid foundation of human resource development. Now, in Tupelo, the process begins the same way the process begins anyway. It begins with a single individual. That's the way it begins, with a single individual. Uh, it always begins with a single individual. There's no way of predicting, in my experience, who that single individual will be. In the case of Tupelo, it was George McLean, who was the owner and publisher of the newspaper. He was the single individual. And what happens is this. That individual will build a team. That's very important. That individual is virtually powerless. I don't care how bright they are. George McLean is a very bright fellow, and a very courageous fellow, and a very knowledgeable fellow, but he was virtually powerless. That individual will build a team, sort of, look, sort of like that. I'm using a different color there. And just about that small, the most basic, the most important thing in leadership is this. Trust. It is the foundation of leadership. Without trust, there is no leadership. Leadership is an engagement. It is a relationship. And it's trust that binds it together. I'm certain of that. This is 1940. Remember that McLean had sided with the laborers in 37, right? Which has alienated him from almost every business leader in the town. Now what he would do, he held Bible classes in his home on Wednesday evenings. And he invited people to come in. Well, with his reputation, you know, it's a little bit questionable. But he would stay on them. You know, look, we won't talk politics, we won't talk strike, we'll just talk about religion. Because you're interested in religion. And Joy McLean would ask each one of them, do you know so and so? them to come to the Bible class. And they did. And they gradually built up the Bible class. And that became that team. That was the team right there. Those people at that Bible class. Now what I'm telling you is very important. The key to community development is creating eventually organizations. Remember the chart? And creating organizations in which you can get participation. That was one way you could get participation. They didn't talk politics. They didn't talk economics. They talked the Bible. That was common ground. <coughs> Leadership, you got to find the common ground. Don't you? That was common ground. McLean had set out to become a Presbyterian minister, but his social theories were too radical, 
and he ended up buying the newspaper in Tupelo instead. He saw Tupelo as a great opportunity to do the work that he was committed to, improving the lives of disadvantaged people. He used the paper as a way to promote his ideas, and he also traveled to the local churches. He would preach in churches in the area, and he would pound on the pulpit and say, the poor people of this county are your brothers and sisters, and you have an obligation to them. People would say, amen, brother, but nothing happened. Nothing happened. Fundamentally, McLean understood that it would take more than charity to improve the lives of the poor. The local economy would need to be transformed. People have to have jobs or they can't even stay in the community. If you lose jobs, you're going to lose the population, your community's going to die. That's the very first thing that has to happen, I'm convinced, is that you must attack the economy first. You may attack other people. But unless you get on with the economy, the rest of it is window dressing. And in fact, unless you attack the economy, if people don't have jobs, they can't stay there, they can't support themselves. You don't have taxes to run your schools, you don't have anything. You must, I'm convinced, attack the economy first. So just exactly how do you go about transforming the local economy? The answer to your problems in your community may very well not lie within your community. It may not. In fact, the probability that it doesn't lie in your community is extremely great. If you had figured out the answer to the problem, some you would have already done it, you would already solved it. So you might assume that the answer is not there, that it's somewhere else. So let's think about this for just a moment. You're an agricultural economy. 80 to 90% of the people are linked into agriculture. It's 1940. Who knows more about agriculture and innovations in agriculture than anybody else? So McLean traveled to the top agricultural schools in the nation, and he found his answer in a conversation with a professor at the University of Wisconsin. Years later, Grisham interviewed that professor and found that he still remembered the encounter with the brash young newspaper editor from Mississippi. And he said, he, he said, I don't know what he asked me. He said, I do remember him. He said, he came in one day and he said, I think he shook his finger in my face. And he said, how do you raise the income level of poor farmers? And he said, he went on and told me, he says, if you don't know the answer to that question, then you ought to get out of the teaching business. Because you're not helping anybody, all you're doing is drawing us out. So he said, I took that as a challenge. So he said, now where are you from? He said, I'm from Lee County, Mississippi. So he said, I called a couple of graduate students, and I said, find me some, go get me some census data, some agricultural census data, and get it real quick, bring it in here. And he said, said Mr. Pine, you, you got some time to wait around here? And he said, sure. So they brought just, just real simple data. He said, I remember, we, we laid it out there, and I looked at it, and he said, the, the answer was pretty obvious to me. And he said, now, you're cotton farmers, aren't you? And he said, look at the cotton production in Lee County. And he said, this once was a very productive cotton area problem. And, and it was in the prairie section. And he said, uh, but look here. Look what's been happening to cotton production. It's been going down steadily this is in 1940. It's been going down steadily since 1900. Look at these figures. Now, he said, I don't know where you're from, but I can just guess that what's actually happened is that your topsoil is probably washed away. He said, what are you going to have to do? He said, you know, without ever going there, I can tell you that, that your land probably will only grow grass and trees. That's about all your land is going to grow. And trees would take too long to develop, and so that's not going to happen. That's not the answer to your problem. And I would recommend you get into something that you get a weekly or, or daily income. <coughs> because again, part of the problem is in cotton production, and I don't know if you know anything about cotton production, but in cotton production, you see, you get one check a year when, you, when your cotton comes in. That means, for the most part, you're going to have to live on credit. And these people, the credit was actually 
the, the interest they were paying exceeded the profit. So they were getting poorer in every way you could get poorer. I mean, it was, it was just compounding itself. So he said, you're going to have to get into something that will give you a daily or weekly income. So he said, well, what is that? He said, poultry and dairy. So he said to him, well, and I could hear George McLean asking this question, because he always asks it. What's it going to cost? And he said, well, what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to start with some good breed stock. And you got to get a good, some good bulls. And he said, well, what's, what's it going to cost us to get the really good, good bulls? And he said, um, we're going to put it in today's terminology, April 2003. Probably $400,000, $500,000 per bull. It's going to cost a lot of money. And he claims that, gee, there's only one farmer in all of Lee County that can afford that bull. I called him a Nazi in a front page of the Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> he also owned that old textile mill. <laughs> so I don't think he's going to give us any money. <laughs> That's a safe bet. <laughs> To make the jump to dairy farming in Tupelo would ultimately require embracing a brand new agricultural innovation. Again, McLean looked outward to find answers. What he would do every morning at 6 a.m. He was up by 6 a.m. up at 5.30. 6 a.m. He would sit in a straight chair, have a cup of coffee and a piece of toast. A very small man, about 5, 8, 5, 9, maybe weighed 150. Uh, and he would start with a stack of magazines and newspapers on this side, uh, on the left side. And he was lo looking for ideas. I mean, he, he would include the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Christian Science Monitor, Washington Post, a lot of magazines. Came across an article that was kind of buried in the New York Times. And it was about a fellow who was experimenting in artificial insemination in upstate New York. Bang, the light went on. He called George McLean from Lee County, Mississippi. Tell me about this artificial insemination. Okay, I told him, he said, will it work? He said, yeah, it's good work. All right, he said, we're trying to get into the dairy business. I think this is the key. Will you come down to Lee County and help us get a program going? No, he said, I will. So he's, he said, you know, you've got to help us. Somebody's got to help us. We're, we're, we're desperate. We're among the worst people in the United States. We want, we're not looking for somebody to do something for us. We want to do something. Help us do for ourselves. So finally he relented and he said, look, there's a fellow experimenting in artificial insemination over in the Boot Hill, Missouri. I heard him give a paper. And he said, now, he isn't as good as I am. And he isn't as good as I am because he's not as smart as I am. And since he's not as smart as I am, he might even come to Mississippi. And he tracked him down. He said it took him several months to track him down. Uh, he had his name, but he, but he finally got a hold of him. I know this man very well. His name is Gail Cockle. If we pay you, will you come here and help us set up a program, a dairy program in our area? What it cost? Well, he said about eight hundred to thousand to a million dollars. That's in today's terminology. Now, you're just talking to the poorest county in the United States. Like the problem's yours. Where are you gonna get that money? George McLean, without using the word venture capital, he did not use the word venture capital. He went up and down Main Street. He talked to people. Just as I told you, it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. And he said, I think I've got an answer to our problem. The dairy business is getting artificial in some way. Now, McLean, remember, is this good Christian. And so he had, had by and large, stressed that it was their, there was their moral obligation to help their fellow man. Nobody listened. I'm going to tell you the story exactly as it happened. It was told to me in a hardware store. George McLean walked into a hardware store. 
Remember what the businessman thought about him. Remember that. Keep that in mind. I walked into the hardware store and he goes up to the owner and he sticks out his hand and he says, I'm George McClain. The man who was telling the story was the hardware store owner. He told me, he said, I put my hands in my hand. I mean, I made a fat <coughs> chest. I was shaking your hand. Yeah, I know who you are. <coughs> that white communist aside with those laborers back in that strike of 37. Now he said, uh, I guess you know, I don't subscribe to your newspaper, I don't put an ad in your newspaper, and I never win. But you're wasting your time. So I'm not here to sell you that. Now, you're here to buy something off one of the other trucks. I don't know. I'm not here to talk to you. Businessman, businessman. Businessman, hell. You ain't no damn businessman. You ain't nothing but a damn communist. <laughs> Get out of my store. He said, I started pushing this a big man. Six boys, about 280. Boys from planes, five, nine, one, two. I'm going to be much of a shouting contest. So he said, I started pushing. I literally put my hand on his chest and started pushing him out the door. And he said, I got him right to the door. And then he said, I remember what he said to me. He said, how much did you gross last year? Man, he said, that made me mad at him being a communist. Uh, he said, this guy, he had no manners at all. How did your parents marry him? You don't ask him how much you made. He said, I, I pushed him. Pushed him on his rear end. He didn't say rear end. Clean that part. Clean stumble out the door, literally. <coughs> almost into the, he said, he, he almost went off into the curb. He said, I really gave him a shove. And he said, I bet you grossed $2,000 last year. Well, now, you're, you're a business people. Grossing $2,000, you'll be out of business pretty quickly. He said, hell, I grossed $8,000 last year. And then he said, I remember what he did. He whipped out the census. Show me. He said, okay. I'll tell you why you only grossed. $8,000. We live in the poorest county in Mississippi. And as long as your customers are poor, they can't buy things with you. Right? That's common sense, but very few people think that. Very few people think that. In the fancy terminology, that's a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm <laughs> that as long as your customers are poor, you will be poor too. And he put it to him in those terms. How can I help them? You can help them to be better farmers. How? By investing in this artificial insemination program. By investing in this dairy program. And I'll guarantee you, next year, You'll gross 10,000, 12,000, 14,000. The hardware store only told me, I quit pushing. <laughs> McLean found the leverage he needed by helping the merchants understand that improving the local economy was in their own best interests. Charity is commendable, but self interest is much more reliable. Now he's connecting here with self interest. Right here, we're talking dollars and cents. 17 people joined that venture company, venture uh, capital group, 17. Many of them went down to the Citizens Bank, took out a loan <coughs> using their business as collateral. Now, the first year that those cattle gave milk, it added, and I'm going to give it to you in today's dollars, in April of 2008, it, it added $2 million to the economy. Now, did those merchants get their money back? How? Farmers made more money, they spent more I interviewed these merchants. They could show me in the cash register. Receipts and 
up 14%, 20%, 30%. After 10 years, it was adding on more than $100 million to the economy, right there. And it went directly to the poor people. Is that genius? Is that genius or what? Their dairy program was so good that between 1940 and 1950, the leading dairy magazine cited Lee County, Mississippi, as the most innovative dairy county in the United States five times in 10 years. Tupelo's leaders realized that transforming their agricultural sector was only the beginning, and that they would need to expand their efforts into manufacturing as well to continue growing the economy. But to expand into manufacturing would require an educated workforce. Every community was urged to build a daycare center. It was the first thing they were urged to do. That was where you put the children while mom and daddy went to school at night. Because that's the only time mom and daddy went to school. Now, what they did then, there are manufacturers of mobile homes in Tupelo area. They had some mobile homes built without walls. So build us a mobile home. Tax it to a tractor, pull it to the community, and that's the schoolhouse. It's a mobile schoolhouse. You train people to be literate at night. Over the next 10 years, they educated 50,000 people. Not only in their county, but in the surrounding counties. What they knew was, and they knew it early on, you can't, you're going to move from agriculture to manufacturing. You don't want low-wage industries. That's not what you want. You want high-wage industries. You want skilled laborers. You don't want unskilled laborers. You want skilled laborers. You can't take a farmer and put him in a factory and have him be worth more than minimum wage. You're lucky if he's worth that much. That's just a plain truth. Of that. We're, we're not being cruel. We're just telling the truth. You don't want to sell cheap labor. You want to sell skilled laborers. You have to have an education. In 1947, they attracted the first new industry. That was very difficult to get an industry to come in there. And for no other reason for that strike of 37, the memory was very long. Uh, they attracted their second industry two years later. So there was, the community was filled with comments. Boy, we got two industries in two years. We're doing real good. We know how to do it now. Four years later, they got the next <coughs> industry. So, oh, we really know how to do it now. About four years later, they got to the next thing. By 1967, Lee County attracted more new industrial jobs than the other 81 counties of Mississippi combined. But as they went forward, they also realized that they had to look beyond industrial manufacturing to build an economic base that would be sustainable. By and large, they made a conscious decision in 1970, the manufacturing jobs would go away. And the kind of jobs they'd have to create in the future would be jobs built around education and learning. And so they came together in a meeting, much like you have here, and they spent an entire day asking the question, what will attract high paid, low polluting jobs high education. Their answer was to make health care the next step in economic development, and they did it in a big way. Today, the medical center, the North Mississippi Medical Center in Jubilee, Mississippi, is the largest employer in the town. Now, I told you that Tupelo today is a, has 34,000 people. Tell me how many people you think are employed at the medical center. 6,000 people. The story of Tupelo provides one example of how local people can solve local problems. But it's also worth noting that they typically looked outside the community to find ideas and answers. Then they looked within the community to find the resources needed to turn these ideas into reality. By using this approach, they avoided creating a dependency on outside resources that might be here today and gone tomorrow. Now, we've got $100 million. 
What he did now was to begin to look around and create some kind of permanent organization that would allow him to capture that money. Don't lose your money. Capture it. How can you do that? How can you capture your money and hold it? To sustain the work, they created the Community Development Foundation, a membership organization supported by dues paid by the local businesses. What I will tell you is, unless you formalize your organ, unless you begin to take these people and put them into a formal organization, it'll dissolve. And I got hundreds of cases in my studies that'll show you that. It will dissolve. It'll, it'll, it'll go its own way. You gotta have a permanent organization, somebody who gets up, every day thinking this is the most important thing to do. They also created rural development councils that would compete with each other through participating in community development efforts. Each year, the community with the most points received a cash prize. So what they did was to set up competition between rural communities. Well, they called them rural community development councils. What you would do in a community is that you would get points. Here's the way you get points. If your child missed no school during the year, you got 500 points. Well, whose interest is that if this child doesn't miss school? The child and mom and dad, right? If you paint your house, you get 500 points. If you take an educational course to improve some skill, you get 500 points. If you inoculate your children against all childhood diseases, you get a thousand points. Remember, all you've got is people out there. And you're looking at them. You're looking at the children first. If you attend conferences on improving agriculture, you attend them all 300 points or whatever. You get points for everything. If you set up a rural community development council, you get a thousand points. If everybody in that community has a hundred percent attendance, you get fifty thousand points. And by 1960, they had about eight thousand volunteers in the rural communities alone. I count this. Group. That's incredible. You got 8,000 people in a little place like that working. You just got little ants and bees, and they're all going to town. And it's all about self interest. But the real genius of Tupelo lies in the fact that they have created a culture in which everyone is expected to participate. That's true in Tupelo. Unless you're willing to put your time and energy in there, now, they can't kick you out of town. I ask people, what happens if you don't get involved? They say, well, nobody will play golf with you. Nobody will play tennis with you. They won't invite you to their home. They'll treat you like an outsider. They treat you with the contempt that they ought to treat you with, to be perfectly honest. In the end, Tupelo has succeeded because they have been able to bring people together, to plan together, and to work together toward a shared vision of the future. It began with one person exercising extraordinary leadership, but it has succeeded because everyone has a stake in building a brighter future together. Every, every story, of course, has a beginning and a middle and, and, and in a sense an end. But in the case of Tupelo, really, the end hasn't come. In fact, the community continues to evolve. Is that a great story? I mean, that's a great story. They're going to write the graph.